Hey everybody, I'm Rick Beato. I'm here with Aaron Marshall. Aaron is the guitar player and founder of the band Intervals. I'm a really big fan of Aaron's because he plays really interesting lines uh, with a lot of intervals in them. Yeah. And so I, just, I said to Aaron, I was like, well, why don't you play something since you're here? Mm -hmm. And so we put together a, a little pedal board yes. really quick. And this sounds really good right and, now. And uh, we're going through this Fender Deluxe amp, and Aaron's going to play something for us. It's easy, yeah. And this is also really cool, too, because I feel like a lot of people that are into this style of music and stuff, they are so used to plugging a guitar into a modeler. And there's... He, he was totally like, oh, I can just plug into anything. Let's just grab something. He gra we grabbed some pedals and... Yeah, well, Rick has an imp incredible pedal collection. So, <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Right now, all you're hearing is a Keeley compressor, a Strymon timeline, and this Fender Deluxe reverb, which I've never met until today. And it's just like an effortless clean tone. Love it, love it, love it. When you do all your kind of the, all this really beautiful flowing intervallic playing, where did mm. you get those ideas from? Where did you start to, where did you develop your style from? Um, that's a good question. I mean, you know, when you sit down and you just play, these things just sort of happen, of course. But uh, in the context of like something like, you know, Rick says play, okay, what do you play? Um, well, I, 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 I tend to think in chords. Um, and you probably don't hear that as much, but for me, it's the guideline for how I'm moving between lines. So in something like this, uh, I think the first chord I played was like A flat minor. And then, you know, from there, I'm thinking about my options in terms of how I can almost accompany myself as if there was a chord progression moving, even if it's not that obvious. So in A flat, I can take advantage of this E Lydian sound, yep. right? And we can get these types of sounds. And as I move, so over F sharp, we're gonna get that Mixolydian sound, and maybe we get G as a passing tone back in A flat. I'm just thinking in chords, basically. Yeah. That's why I like your guitar playing, because it's it's uh, it's very chordal. All your linear stuff is very chordal. You use a lot of uh, wide interval jumps, and you use a lot of chord shapes, mm. and, and so it's uh, it's really descriptive and it's very melodic. Thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, a lot, a lot of what I'm trying to do is, yeah, is, is, I mean, outside of the context of my music where I can accompany myself with any number of instruments in different ways throughout the composition, when I'm playing, I want to sound full and accompanied by myself, you know? By the way, you should follow Aaron on Instagram. Mm. I keep telling him he needs to post more <laughs> videos of him just just noodling around on the guitar. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but but definitely follow him. Your Instagram is at Aaron Intervals, or if you just search Intervals on Instagram, it comes right up. Yeah, and it's the one with the blue check mark. So, um, I was telling him I don't have a blue check. Mark. No, Rick and Rick's got me beat <laughs> everywhere, and he doesn't <laughs> no, have a blue check. That's mark. not true. That's not true. Um, but yeah, so yeah, and, and funny enough. You know, we have and flow with the way we do content and off camera. We were discussing this, but uh, when I'm at home and we're not touring, that's it's when I tend to post more of the videos of me playing, or I'll do live streams and more candid type stuff. Of course, we're on tour, you know, now, and everything is, you know, the idea is to to capture what's happening on a nightly basis. Also, um, if you guys are interested, you know, definitely check out my Instagram. We run a daily vlog that uh, my media guy, Mike D'Amelia, shoots. And uh, he's a madman. Um, you know, we, for consecutive stretches of, I think the last time we did it, it was 45 days and we're approaching, you know, some maybe 30 at this point. Now we've been on tour for about five weeks, but we run a daily vlog um, every day in the story that shows you what last night and the entire day looked like at the venue and all the goings on at the show and everything. And then there's still photography and videos and stuff. So we go, we, we go pretty crazy with content on tour, so. Okay, so let's talk about when you're uh, when you are touring. What is your touring rig? You play through an XFX three, yeah. mm -hmm. and tell me how you have it set up as far as your uh, how do you monitor? Are you guys do you guys use in ears or anything, or what are you doing? What in you ears, do yeah, and that's crucial to us. Um, we switched over to ears just over a year ago. We and have, how do you uh, like that? Love it. 
Okay. I was a little freaked out at first because I'm I'm so used to just putting earplugs in and just dialing in a wedge to sound. Yeah. You know, what however it suits the room and my mood at the time or whatever. Um but no, we're we're completely self-contained apart from the house's system. Um we can actually set up and do a full production intervals show from an audio standpoint in about 15 minutes with our rig. So I was wondering about this using in-ears and then using with your with your axe effects. Is it exactly the same every night? Is there a snapshot with it? Do you have a board that, that controls your in-ears that has a snapshot that sets it up? Yep, we carry an X32. We have a 32 um, input um, snake that basically uh, allows us to, um, it's a split as well. So everything is loomed and coming in from the stage into the um, into the split and then one side of the split feeds the X32 and then the other side feeds the front of house. So both uh, sides are subject to change, of course, but we do have a show file that we work off of on both ends at the console and at the X32 in the in-ear rack, and we're all individually able to adjust our in-ear mix on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, yeah. is your in-ear in -ear mix mostly you? No. No, and funny <laughs> enough, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's really interesting. Depending on who you talk to, uh, as far as their respective instruments in any band, it's really interesting to hear what guys like. We were talking to... Um, Blake from Between the Barrier to Me, who we're on tour with now, and Blake plays drums. And he was telling us last night that he has none of himself in his in-ear mix. In fact, it's just the rest of the band, and you know he's sitting over the kit, so he's like, why do I need that? It's right there. Right. Whereas with the way we have it dialed, um, I know that Nathan's taking a good bit, Nathan's my drummer, and he's taking a good bit of himself in his ears, and we have the luxury of doing that, and we like that. For me, personally... Um, I like a really solid foundation that almost resembles the record. Mm. And I am the most minimal component of my... <laughs> I'm, I'm buried to where I can hear myself and I know that I'm there. But everything is nice and cozy and it's like... It's, it's flattering and it's enjoyable for me to... I don't know. Maybe you've experienced this. If the amp is in another room or if you have headphones on or sometimes you can't hear all the top end coming out of your amp that you play a little more confidently and everything yeah, yeah, goes yeah. in your hands. Yeah, if it's too there... And crispy and... Yeah, then you're... you're Kind of, you don't dig in as much. No, 100%. So for me, it's about... We've created the image to where the drum kit is in stereo. Toms are panned throughout the image. Um, my backing tracks, uh, so tracks being any additional accompaniment that uh, you know we can't physically perform. So you know orchestral elements, percussion elements, they're in stereo and they're nice and wide. Uh, both guitars are in stereo, so Travis will be panned further out than I am because he's handling the majority of the rhythm work, and then I'm panned slightly in towards the the center of the image. And then you basically the way I see it is you've got like kick drum and bass guitar in the middle and everything anchoring out and it's essentially like you would mix a record yeah and then i've got just enough of me to where i'm happy and i can hear that i'm there and i exist in the mix but just enough for me to feel comfortable okay. with i want to ask yeah. you here tell me what you practice on the road how often you play your guitar what are you doing when you're touring? It's probably less than I should, to be honest. Right. I essentially have a 10 to 15 minute meet and greet with my guitar in the in the green room before we go on stage. It's enough to just get acquainted, get the hands moving. I actually tried not to overthink and overplay. Mm -hmm. um, warming up too much has been a has been an issue in the past um not from a physical standpoint not from maxing out or, or or expending you know too much energy or anything it's nothing to do with that it's more mental if there's a part that maybe you stumbled over last night or something that's giving okay you give trouble, me okay give me a hard lick from from the show that, that i'm going to come and see tonight okay i'll give you so there's that one that's historically been like if it depends on how much i've slept okay this one is the barometer <laughs> for this one is sleep and um, so we're gonna we're gonna see if Aaron nails this. I didn't right sleep now. very much. Last night, so, <laughs> was um, so let me get a little little heat together. Yeah. Yeah. Managed to get through it, but perfect. <laughs> so I'll that tell you line. where the I'll tell you where the trouble is. The trouble is this line. There was a show at the Croc in Seattle where I was approaching the line and I'm always extremely confident with that run. And I asked myself, is it two notes on the D string or is it 
three <laughs> notes on the A string. And I, why? Why did I even, why did I do that? And then all of a sudden it starts the chain reaction of the next three shows now. Right. What is, what are which playing, one man? is it? So the, I've, I've actually made the mistake of overanalyzing these things in the green room and being yeah. hard on myself, at, you know, going into the following show because it's like, dude, get your shit together, you know? Pardon me. But, um, so it's like, uh, you know, I have to, I have to sometimes just remind myself that there are other variables. Yeah. And one of them being sleep. For example, we were just in India and uh, we were getting on average three or four hours a night if we're lucky. Was that that jet lag? that that, uh, Jet lag and just literally the fact that you have to travel. So you get to the hotel after the gig at 2 a.m. and then lobby calls 5.30 a.m. Yeah. So, and it's the nature of the beast. So the lack of sleep will lead to the following day. It's like, why am I experiencing Okay, let me ask you this. All right, so when you were just playing, this, I don't mean to interrupt, it just popped in my head. If you're standing up playing that, is that any more difficult than sitting down? How different is it? I keep my instrument. I don't wear a bow tie high. No, you but, were, I, but you were pretty high. But 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 enough, just sitting it. down though, because you're resting it, you're resting the guitar. It can be a little bit more comfortable. But actually, I'm in stand up mode right now because I've been on tour for the last five six weeks. So playing sitting is feeling foreign because my world is to play on stage. All right, all right. So. Give me give me one other hard riff that's. One that's hard to play that you're thinking like, okay, I don't know if I, you know. Challenging one, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, there's a line uh, or a, a segment in, um, let's see. Um, For some reason, if I'm not really like, and they're, they're pretty innocuous lines, but if I'm not really thinking about where everything's supposed to go, little things, it's the seemingly more simple things, the more single note vocal type things that where it's like, now you take it for granted sometimes, you really need to stay cognizant of every individual event in, in, a, in, a, in a sequence like that. So I'll find myself making mistakes on little things like that, whereas more challenging ones, I tend to like get ready for it. And then, you know, that can go one way or another because tension actually leads to issues as well. So yeah. Well, well, what, what I find interesting is that you're a super clean player on your parts, but you can also improvise. Yeah. yeah you mean, can it's... also, you can, you can just, you know, you know, you can rip and improvise, but yet when you're playing these things that you're very, I mean, there's not a buzz note, nothing. It's well, very clean. The, fu- the interesting thing is that I develop these calculated lines based on improvisation in the first place, because yeah. I'll, I'll create the section. Um, chords for that are like a, it's a really simple section, just a couple, right? And you put that on loop and get in the pocket with it. And I'm just messing with it as if it's like, this is my own little backing track, you know? And then it's, <laughs> and then you develop these lines and then commit to them. And they're, but they are the product of improvisation in the first place, actually. Let's so. talk about the instrumental uh, music scene. Sure. I don't want to call it progressive music scene, even though it's pretty progressive. I mean, I'd say I mean, what, how do you define it? Yeah, progressive. Progressive instrumental. People music. always ask, you know, the Uber driver will ask, you know, oh, I see you're on tour. Like, you know, they see the tour pass or whatever. Like, what do you guys make? Like, what kind of music are you into? You know, and uh, it's like, yeah, instrumental rock meets metal, you know, no vocals. And they always go, oh, no vocals. <laughs> no vocals. <laughs> um, yeah, so in, in, in progressive rock, progressive instrumental rock, I guess. Okay, know. so I'm a big fan of that style and of all the new, new, sure. new bands. Yeah. Out like like your band and not having vocals to me is, I think a really cool part of it. I think so too. Uh, why has it taken off so much in the last couple of years? It's for, uh, this is a number of reasons. I mean, one of them, to be honest, as far as I mean, this is a bit of a left field sort of notion, but I think that you know whether we we choose to acknowledge it or not, you know, mainstream music and pop music does have an influence. It has a downstream effect on all of us and how we perceive certain things. And I think the advent of, as far as for younger musicians and um, the younger generation, I think the advent of um, EDM or you know electronic dance music, where yeah. some of the biggest songs, the focal point or the drop is like a synth line. Yeah, and there's no vocal. Yeah. I think that that's actually sort of 
subconsciously justified that popular music doesn't need to be about heartbreak or like it's so spelled out. It can be about an emotion or a vibe or a feeling. And one of the biggest players in that entire space is from where I'm from in Toronto, Dead Mouse. Yeah. Joel Zimmerman. Yeah. And, you know, his music is incredible and it's literally reached, you know, everybody on the planet. He's, he's such an enormous artist and his biggest you know moments like these these uh, you know some of the, the the things that he's known best for are they, there's just no vocal it's just about this feeling you get from that that synth sound that he's created and the overall emotion of like when that drop hits or the hook whatever it is and i think that that has sort of had this downstream effect on uh, people understanding that like okay you know that's acceptable in rock music too and that you know riffs have underlying melodies in them that are catchy and beyond the riff there's always the you know certain certain guys in this world you know myself being one of them prioritized the single note vocal-esque hook on the guitar yeah and i love it i mean for me where it comes from was the soundtrack to my sort of childhood or my upbringing was my dad was really into like pat Metheny and yeah and guys like that that were so good at that for me that one of the biggest things was this moment in any and it can happen in any scale of course but just the way you know just that that passing tone yeah all right that sort of vocal quality of whether it's octaves or single notes and just the way notes just meander between scale tones and it's that that you know, as close as you can get to being vocal with the instrument, had a massive impact on the way I hear things. And you can cite that and well, Pat, boast of my I mean, solos. I mean, lines. Pat is one of the most, uh, his playing is so vocal. Extremely. Uh, I mean, he was a huge influence on me when yeah. I was growing up too, because he spanned multiple generations and I'm not much younger than your dad. So, uh, but but that's, uh, that's really interesting that uh, to, to hear that. I think it's really cool. Tell me about, you put your last record out 2017. Yep. You've got this tour going on right now. Mm -hmm. When are you guys going to put out a new record? My most recent effort came out December 2017. And like we were talking about before, I sort of began the touring cycle summer 2017. And we've pretty much done, uh, barring a few regions, essentially a world tour um, with a couple of little two-month, three-month breaks here and there. Uh, which is enough time to go home and pack your apartment and move it or, you know, deal with life things and stuff. So um, there's some sketches on the go, but uh, we're deliberately spending the beginning of 2020 with uh, me in the studio, uh, my home studio, working on pre-production, writing, and getting ready to edge towards hopefully tracking something in the spring or early summer and then swing back with a release not too long after we have a master. Okay, will your record be made on a laptop? Ha! <laughs> we were talking about this earlier, about, <laughs> about how it's absurd when you hear people say, oh, they made the record on a laptop. It's like, yeah, it's a computer. Everybody does. <laughs> like, the, the, the MacBook Pro and the yeah. iMac are synonymous at this point. It's right. the physical format. But yes, um, we do a bit of a hybrid. The last couple of records, the vast majority of things do happen in the box, of course. Never drums, though. Always yeah. live drums. That's, I mean, that creates the entire, sets the tone for the entire record yeah big time the the, the the album lives in the space the drums live in so that's an album only sounds as good as the drums that's, big what, time. I was, that's what i always said it's enormous enormous detail so um we always prioritize that and then uh, we've played around with various ways of achieving guitar tones um in the early days of course you know no problem committing to an axe effects guitar tone on record but uh, starting at the shape of color in 2015 i wanted to try my hand at reamping mm-hmm and um, we got some tones that we're really happy with. There's a lot of really quirky tones on that album, two things that I think happened, little happy accidents and mistakes and things where we're like, oh, wow. And I have a hard time even remembering some of the signal paths on that, and I'm pretty good with that. And we just went crazy. On this last record, um, as we were recording, um, I had a pedal board and some amps and a load box, and we were making notes as we were tracking. We are of course, recording DIs, but yeah. we are also using rough snapshots of the equipment that we thought we would probably end up reamping with in the end. So we'd have a little note in Pro Tools that said, you know, um, um, Mesa, Triple Crown 100, Blue Channel, uh, and then whatever the pedal chain was in front. And then when it got to the reamp process, I was able to reference the note. And then... But you already had the DIs recorded. DIs were recorded, so now we're running them back through, and we would start at the note. So we would recreate the signal path, 
based on the note that we took, like whatever I, I, I tracked the DI with at the time. And the reason for that was, I think that there is something that gets lost when you obviously have to convert the DI and, and the way you touch that particular signal chain, if you're like roughing it in with a modeler, and first of all, the front end of a modeler reacts completely different to, for example, how I'm touching this amp and yeah. the way my guitar feels in my hands versus yeah. being plugged into a, a digital box. Um, I think something got lost in translation when we reamped the shape of color because we used a modeler to get all the DIs. And then if I had like an overtone on a note or there's like a really nice bit of extra feedback, you know, when a note just takes off, sure. we were having a really hard time coaxing getting, those out. Yeah, yeah. But the guide track has it, but I can't make the amp do it. And I was really bummed about some of that. Yeah. So we were able to get a little bit closer on the, the way forward because we had used very similar signal paths, but still, I'm still not in love with the concept. So who knows what I do? I think, especially now with the Axe FX3, and, and I'm a major fractal advocate, um, I'm getting tones now that I'm so in love with, and same with the Neural DSP plugins. I'm not sure that these are the types of things that would make a final product. I don't know until I get there, until I've developed the aesthetic of the album, and I know that intuitively I'm like, I want to take it in this direction. Um, we'll see, but at the end of the day, everything's so good these days, and I trust my ear and the engineers and producers that I work with that we're always going to wind up with a product well, we're happy well, with. Well, if you ever want to come and track guitars, I have a few amps here. Just a couple. That uh, that you could possibly track through. <laughs> yeah, so. I would love that, honestly. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll probably utilize something to do with the space in some capacity. No lie, this is it's very impressive to be here. When you see it on on YouTube, it's different. It hits different in person. It's, it's crazy. It's awesome. Well, Aaron, I really appreciate you coming in and sure. hanging out and really look forward to the show tonight. Awesome. And uh, great to meet you in person. For sure. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate awesome. it. Thanks. Awesome. I'd like to once again thank Aaron for being my guest today. Don't forget to go check out his band Intervals on Spotify and follow him on Instagram. Just subscribe here to my Everything Music YouTube channel. If you're a first time viewer, remember to ring the bell. If you're interested in the Beato book, go to my website at www.rickbeato.com. I've got a new ear training course. The Beato ear training course is now available. If you have a bad ear or want to improve your ear and become a master, go watch the intro video at beatoeartraining.com. Follow me on Instagram at rickbeato1. And if you want to support the channel even more, think about becoming a member of the Beato Club. You can find transcriptions of some of my Instagram pieces and the videos here on YouTube. You can also have your music critiqued by me. That's one of the levels. I do a reaction video of it. So check it out. Thanks so much for watching. Oh,